a vibrant national economy with employment opportunities for everyone that is vital to our individual and national interests. Now, fulfilling that vision of the jobs, 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 quite frankly, is impossible without education, education, education. A national report released earlier this month said that our nation's security and economic prosperity were at risk if our schools don't improve. Our federal, state, and local governments are still the most important guarantors of a decent education that is a pathway to success and opportunity. From good public schools to top-notch community colleges and four-year universities, we need to make a lifelong commitment to learning that is accessible and affordable. Look around the room. You all are a shining example of the effect that a good education can have on a child's life. And we need to make sure we expand that opportunity for each and every one of our neighbors. Now, along with the overarching need to use jobs and education uh, to get our economy working for the 21st century, I believe there's three other critical components to our generation's success. Three things that are actually at stake in this election. One, energy independence. Two, national debt. And three, universal health care. Take a look turn. Energy independence is a goal that has been talked about for 40 years. Follow this. Every president from Nixon, you have Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, and Obama. Right? They all have said they wanted to be eight of them. Have said that they wanted to be the president to deliver energy independence. Well, we, they've all talked about the same thing, that we need to wean ourselves off of a debilitating uh, addiction to foreign oil. The pain of rising prices leads inevitably to renewed calls for a new energy economy. After the sticker shock forces consumers to drive less and turn to more fuel-efficient cars, consumption drops, prices of oil drops, and all of a sudden, cheap oil trumps tough choices. Well, 40 years seems to be about enough. And we need a comprehensive energy plan that includes conservation, because the cheapest energy we have is the energy we actually don't use. Energy efficiency, because we're losing 40% of all the energy we have now that to power our homes, offices, and schools. Fuel efficient vehicles, because 75% of the oil that we actually use goes to our vehicle fleets. Four, renewable energy resources, because you're not going to be able to get yourself off of foreign oil without a robust solar, wind, geothermal, hydrogen. You need a, a mix of all if you're going to get serious about it. And five, a responsible oil and natural gas development and policy. Because fossil fuels aren't going anywhere anytime soon. And in fact, if we have a way to cleanly, efficiently, and responsibly develop them, they can be a huge piece of the puzzle. Now, while well, mortgaging our national energy future to foreign interests, we've also surrendered financial independence. Every day, we buy a billion dollars worth of foreign oil, and we sell a billion dollars of our debt. That's $15 trillion in total, or $50,000 for each and every one of you. Asian banks alone over own over three trillion of our promissory notes. Every dollar of that debt is a roadblock to young families, young leaders, young entrepreneurs, and you, who will undoubtedly find their choices, your choices, limited by a country's careless and fiscal habits. The only way we can start a very long process of restoring our fiscal sanity is a balanced approach involving both spending and revenue. Tax reform is also essential. Closing loopholes like carried interest, eliminating tax breaks to oil and gas companies, and passing the buffer rule to ensure that millionaires pay at least some share of the, the same share of income as their secretaries is probably a good place to start. Now, briefly about healthcare. Providing access to quality, safe, affordable healthcare isn't just a human priority, it's an economic one. We are already seeing a few fruits of that reform in our state where every person can honestly say that they are no longer one bad gene or one bad accident away from medical bankruptcy. We've got 98% of all people covered and 100% of all children. At the same time, we're now leading the way in experience of cost containment with this global payments model that is now going to allow providers to be rewarded for the quality of care that they provide and not just the quantity of prescriptions that they order. Now, in spite of the rhetoric that we hear from Washington, the Affordable Care Act is going to save over 
$100 billion over the first decade and over a trillion dollars in the second. The full implementation of the Affordable Care Act is still years away. It's already having a major impact on the lives and budgets of working families. Insurance companies are already barred from using pre-existing conditions as a pretext for denying coverage. And gender bias in payments is illegal, ending the practice of charging more for women than for men for the exact same coverage. One father that I know has two kids, both out of college, whose coverage uh, as dependents was extended until age 26 as part of the Affordable Care Act. Both of those children, who couldn't afford to pay for health insurance on their own, faced serious medical issues in the last year. Without the Affordable Care Act, that family would have gone bankrupt. Now, there might have been a lot of policy in there, but it leads to a fundamental question. What kind of country do you and I want to pass on to our children? We all want a nation that is stronger than the one we inherited from our parents. A society where our children, no matter where they came from or what they started with, has that fair chance, a fair opportunity to succeed. A society that each one of us helped to create, and a society that we all believe in. Many of folks out there will say that we're too young to make a difference. My grandfather, Robert Kennedy, spoke about the possibilities of youth when he visited South Africa in 1966. Then, in a country mired in apartheid, he told the students who gathered to hear him speak that, quote, a young monk began the Protestant Reformation. A young gentleman extended an empire from Macedonia to the borders of the earth. And a young woman reclaimed the territory of France. It was a young Italian explorer who discovered the new world, and a 32-year-old Thomas Jefferson who proclaimed that all men are created equal. Today, I can now add that it was a 34-year-old preacher who told us that he had a dream. A 43-year-old president who asked what we could do for our country. And it was a 30-year-old computer programmer who helped ignite a youth movement that brought a revolution to the Middle East. We are not too young, too naive, or too inexperienced to demand change. We are exactly the ones who must drive it. And that same speech, my grandfather said, that this world demands the qualities of youth. Not a time of life, but a state of mind. A temper of the will, a quality of the imagination, the predominance of courage over timidity, of the appetite of adventure over the love of ease. It is a revolutionary world that we live in, and thus it is youth who must take the lead. The need for talented, young, dedicated public servants will always overwhelm the supply. And today, your country needs you more than ever. There's an old rule of thumb in politics that 90% of all 90-year-olds vote, and 25% of all 25-year-olds vote. The 2008 presidential election changed it. But it's up to you to determine whether that was the exception or the beginning of a new rule. We can't do this without you. We need everything you can give from now until election day, because there's no one else I would rather have standing by my side. This is your world. This debate is about the country that you will live in. This is about the future of our nation. And the question that I have for you is what are you willing to do about it? We need your volunteers. We need your boots on the ground. We need your phone calls. We need your social networks. We need your sign holding, your letter writing, and your door knocking. I need you to have my back. And I promise you that I will have yours. Thank you so much for having me here today. I look forward to seeing what each and every one of you can do over the course of the days, weeks, months, and hopefully years to come. Thank you very much.
take a picture with all the students from Emerson before you head out. I heard that from yeah, someone. So can all the Emerson students?